Hello, good evening, welcome. Thank you to so many of you from all over the country, so many students and families for being here for Fort Lewis College's town hall, specifically for our admitted and our confirmed students. We're so excited that you're here. My name is Katie Nestor and I'm the Associate Director of Admission and I'm your guide for the day, for the evening, excuse me. Um, I'd like to begin um, by noting that the land that Fort Lewis College is built upon is the ancestral lands and territories of Nuchu, Apache, the Pueblos, Hopi, Zuni, and the Diné Nation. We think it is important to provide this acknowledgement because the narratives of this land and region have long been told from one dominant perspective without full acknowledgement of the tribes who lived on this land before it was Fort Lewis College. Thank you for your attention and respect in acknowledging this important history. So again, my job is to guide you through our day. And in just a moment, I'll run through the agenda. So we'll talk about everything that we have planned for you. And uh, I just wanna mention that this is what we call a town hall meeting. In a town hall meeting, we bring together representatives from Fort Lewis, together with you, our student and family community. We'll provide you with some information. Thank you all so much for the questions that you pose to us in advance. And then we're gonna provide ample opportunity for you to ask us questions so that we can address those for you in real time. So um, with that, let's talk a little bit about how we, how we go about asking questions and using Zoom. So for those of you that aren't entirely Zoomed out by now, um, one of the great features of uh, the webinar feature within Zoom is the Q&A. So um, in the lower right-ish uh, corner of your screen, you're gonna see Q&A, the little voice boxes. If you click that, you'll be able to type in your question. You may do so with your name or you may do so anonymously. And um, you may ask your question. Others that if you have similar questions, you're welcome to upvote them. So you can click the thumbs up and that will allow the question to rise to the top. So we'll be keeping a very close eye on that chat. We'll be answering questions there. We'll also be pulling some of those questions to answer live to our panelists. So with that said, let's talk about our agenda for the day. So we have a number of excellent folks here to speak with all of you this evening. We'll begin with our, uh, our FLC president, Tom Stridicus, and he's gonna provide a community update. He's gonna talk about all of the exciting things that have been happening this past year and the ways that we have come together as a campus and Durango community to provide a safe and exciting learning environment for our students and how that is moving us into the fall semester um, coming up. So I wanna to preface Tom uh, that uh, by letting all of you know that this is a work in progress. So we're gonna let you know today everything that we do know and everything that we are intending uh, to happen. But as you know, things are changing quickly. So we will update you as quickly as we're able to as well. So just caveat there. We're also gonna have Jeff DuPont, who's our Associate Vice President of Student Affairs. And Jeff is going to be speaking with us specifically about housing, um, housing, health and safety, orientation. We had lots of questions about those. Finally, we're going to be having uh, Jess Savage, who is our Director of Admission. She's gonna be talking about next steps. So things like class registration, our summer timeline, what you should be doing next, depending on where you are in the process. We also have with us in the background, our consulting physician, Dr. Luke Casillas, and he will be here to help support uh, medical and health and safety related questions. So we're planning for about 30 minutes of, uh, of us speaking and we'll provide opportunity for folks to answer quest to ask questions at the end of each presenter. And then we'd like to save somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 minutes for, uh, for general questions coming from the audience. So with that said, I am happy to introduce our president, Tom Stridicus. Thank our you. Stage Jake. Is yours. Yeah, thank you, Katie. It's great to be here with everybody. I wasn't sure if you were saying that I was a work in progress, which is which is true. We're all works in progress. 
Uh, we are so excited to have finished uh, this semester successfully and really be looking toward the fall. Um, parents and, and family members and new students, um, we're just psyched. And, and so let me say that this last year culminated with eight in-person graduations for our graduates. Uh, it was a huge day for our families. We had families here. Uh, and, and it really showed, I think, what is what is amazing about Fort Lewis and our faculty and staff. Um, this year, our faculty and staff did everything literally humanly possible to keep our campus safe and learning. Uh, we had testing protocols, we had mass protocols, we had support, support protocols for students um, if they were put in isolation because of exposure to COVID or if they contracted COVID. We were very public about our data, but it really showed our values. What we did really was to build a community of caring um, that cared for each other, uh, that, that really did it in a way that understood um, how we can best support students. So it was a phenomenal year. Over 70% of our courses were in person this year. I know we have many um, people who are in K-12 right now who's only sort of fully going back um, so our, our people just did an amazing job. And I want, I want the families to know that that energy, that passion, that's, that is, is, is carrying us through the next year. And we're so excited about fall. So looking ahead, um, you know, we, we will really focus again on keeping students safe. Um, you, you might have seen that Fort Lewis College was the first of Colorado public institutions to have a vaccine requirement for faculty, students, and staff. Um, that then followed the rest of the Colorado publics, which issued also a vaccine requirement. We believe fundamentally that um, a fully vaccinated student body is the best way to get back to the things that we love um, and to really maintain uh, the safety of our campus. And we'll, we'll make sure that we, um, you know, get the vaccines readily available in many communities, but it will also be available to people in the fall. And um, our, our good Dr. Casillas is here to talk questions about that. Um, updates up on Gear Up FLC. There's particular questions that people are asking, um, you know, about masks and distancing. I could say it's a working, you know, it's we're taking all the information in as we've done. We communicate with our people. We engage students around the process. But what you can likely expect is um, no masks outside of campus. Um, lots of great student activities going on, particularly outdoors. We are blessed uh, not only in, 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 in being part of the ancestral homelands of our, our many um, Native American tribes that we have the pleasure and honor of working with, but being in an, an amazing outdoor environment with tents and great outdoor activities. So all the information will be up on our FLC Gear Up site. You, you can go to the next slide. Can we go to the next slide to see what's there? Perfect. Um, here's a little bit of information around when we'll be bringing campus to, to when you be bringing to move in. Um, we did a staggered move in. It really worked last year. So August 25th and 26th, um, you'll get an assigned date. It's really important you show up on that assigned date. Uh, likely there'll be some COVID testing as it relates to that. Again, we provided all the testing. And then we'll do our amazing orientation where you'll get a chance to meet faculty and staff and other students and really form those bonds that are so important. And then we'll begin classes uh, on the 30th, uh, which will be super exciting with um, last day of final exams on December 17th. And then right now, tentatively, classes beginning on January 17th. Again, we made it through the entire semester this year, uh, and we have every intention to do that in person moving forward. Next slide. Um, again, classroom instruction, what's it look like? In-person instruction, this year, 70% of our courses were in person. Uh, we expect even more next year. Um, regular classroom capacities. Well, last year we kind of had to spread people out throughout campus. Uh, we had outdoor learning spaces. We'll keep some of those. Students love the tents and we'll have outdoor classrooms. Uh, and then all the great stuff that you know about FLC, labs, field work, hands-on work, close work with faculty, um, that will be returning. And we're really, really super excited about that. Next slide. Uh, you know, this year we, we did a strong job with, with campus life, but next year I'm even so excited to, to make sure that we're moving even further. So 
we're really about making sure students um, have a safe, welcoming, inclusive environment to really grow as individuals and form bonds with each other, as well as with the great staff that we have and in our division of student engagement and our faculty. Um, so the, we had our Student Life Center open this year. We'll have all the great outdoor pursuits um, going on. And then just amazing spaces to hang out on campus. I, I just love the fall when all our students are here and, and we can't wait to see um, everybody there. So I think that is the last slide. I'll turn it over to Jeff. Um, happy to talk uh, again about all of the requirements, all of the things. We'll look a little bit in the Q&A and, and uh, be around to, to get those. Are there any Q&A questions that you want me to take right now, Katie? I haven't had a chance to look in or that you might want Luke to take? Yeah, I would love to pose one um, that is specifically about uh, some of our safety protocols. And I know we're going to be talking about this uh, quite a bit, but in particular, we're wondering if there will be one of our um, attendees is wondering if there will be any different protocols for students who have been vaccinated versus students who have not been vaccinated. Thank you. Great question. Thanks, Katie. Um, and then um, so a couple things on that. Remember, there's a difference between vaccinated and fully vaccinated. So it could be the case that a student's unable to get a vaccine at home and they come onto campus and they're able to get the Pfizer um, here with us. Um, for students who are fully vaccinated, uh, those students will um, not be subject to quarantine if they're exposed, um, which is great news because while our while we did everything we could to make quarantine um, as okay an experience as it could have been, um, you know, being locked in your room for seven days, uh, even when you're getting food delivery and people are checking in on you and giving you all the love we can give you, um, isn't the same thing as being out on an amazing campus. So, um, and then certainly students, we uh, students who are um, fully vaccinated will not be uh, subject to weekly testing or biweekly testing. Again, we're still working out those exact details. But every student, uh, Katie, again, great opportunity to stress this, um, has to participate in our vaccine requirement policy. Um, it's an important part of the safety of who we are. And, and again, we, these vaccines are safe. Um, they're very effective against uh, preventing the disease. And they're really effective against helping our whole community. Um, and right now we really are in a, in a race uh, against, it's really sort of a race amongst vi uh, vaccines against the virus. Dr. Casillas, is there anything that you wanna, uh, again, maybe just a general question on um, as, as our consulting physician, I think it's great for the parents to know that um, doc, we, we have a consulting physician who works with us. He, he's essentially our chief medical officer. He's part of an access health system and has done many amazing bodies of work around, but he's here for us as a resource. Um, but Dr. Casillas, maybe let me keep that question going. Um, talk a little bit about um, the safety of the vaccine and, and really what you're seeing as, as a doctor. Good thing, Tom. Thank you so much for letting me answer that question. So with over the 5,000 vaccines that we've administered just from our organization, not to mention the partnership with our local health department, we've had no actual severe anaphylaxis that we've noticed. I know that was one of the first fears that was out with the vaccines. It's definitely something we screen very heavily in on the front end of the vaccine, but it just hasn't come to fruition as we were fearful it would from the beginning when we started this back in January. Um, I would like to add that just the safety of these vaccines across the board, all three of those that are available, the Johnson & Johnson, the Pfizer, and the Moderna, are, have been shown through the millions of vaccinations, or hundreds of millions of vaccinations that have been given across the world, and the close monitoring through the CDC to be very safe. And I think the safety that it ensures for FLC moving forward with this type of policy is that we're not going to have to be as fearful of spread um, in different subgroups in the area. So you mentioned the quarantine, which I think is huge. The students coming in that are vaccinated will not have to be fearful of not being able to attend class, not being able to get the education that they're really striving for um, when they're attending college. I mean, that's why the kids are here, or the students are, I should say, is to actually go forward with their class and actually continue the learning that we're trying to promote and really instill in them through the college experience. So that's a great thing. The other thing is testing not being mandated like it was in the earlier years that are the earlier months of this year is a huge thing for the students also. Even though FLC did a phenomenal job in standing up the testing to ensure safety, by having a large student body vaccinated, we don't have to be as diligent in our testing and put the students through um, 
that that whole process. So it, it definitely allows them to experience more of the college experience by being vaccinated and not having to be as fearful. We will still have testing, which I know that um, Jeff's going to talk into, because if you become symptomatic, guess what? You need to be tested. The vaccines aren't 100% um, at keeping you from being able to be uh, exposed and, and pick up um, the COVID virus. But definitely they cut the risk down and they cut the risk of severe disease down dramatically, almost closer to 95 to 100%. So that's probably the biggest news of all three vaccines. Dr. Casillas, thank you. And, and, and again, to our incoming students um, and, and family members, I think I wanted you to hear from, excuse me, I wanted you to hear from Dr. Casillas because it really shows the caring community that we have, but not only caring, but how we bring in experts to help us answer the tough questions that we faced. And so um, with that, let me just say, it's gonna be an awesome year. I cannot wait to meet each of you uh, in the fall. Can't wait to see your smiles. I uh, can't wait to hear about your stories. Um, Fort Lewis College is an amazing place. I, I cannot tell you how awesome our faculty and staff are. And let me turn it over to our, my good colleague, Jeff DuPont, who, who led our entire uh, work around health this year. Uh, he, he'll speak to some other things too. He, he has lots of things he does. He's not just um, the health guy, but uh, uh, Jeff, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Tom. So, so yeah, we're gonna start by talking about what campus will look like from a health perspective. And I, like Tom, am super excited to get back to the way life used to be. Um, so we're hoping if we can follow a few of these protocols and, and hopefully we can lessen some of these restrictions as we move through the semester and we get more of our communities vaccinated. So I'll, I'll just start by saying, you know, we've always tried to educate our community first, uh, which is where the health awareness certification comes in. That will be launched as part of Pre-Campus Academy, which is part of our pre-orientation package. And you will get that information on August 2nd. And so please make sure to pay attention to those protocols. We'll really outline what's the difference between being vaccinated and, being, and not being vaccinated at Fort Lewis College. How do those protocols change? We'll be very specific on how those students will be able to manage the fall semester. Um, it is due prior to move-in, so you will need to complete that course before you move in. Um, the other piece that we have started doing as of the spring, if you're registering for the fall semester, we have this FLC Together Pledge. One thing I think we did a really good job of last year was emphasizing the community of care across campus. So we're, we're doing all these things to keep each other safe and healthy. And so it's imperative that we all know what that means. And so the FLC Together Pledge, when you see that, it outlines, here's what I'm willing to do as a Fort Lewis Skyhawk. And we're, we will hold you accountable to that in order to keep our community safe. Screening and testing, um, it will look a lot different. We, we're not gonna be doing screening, as Tom said, for those that have been fully vaccinated. So they will not be required to test on a regular basis. We will ask them if they have symptoms to get tested just to make sure that they're they're not contagious. Um, we will have students and employees self screen So that means you will, we have a Fort Lewis app that hopefully you have downloaded already. And on that app, it prompts you to say if you have any symptoms or not. And it lists all the symptoms and every day, all of our community members should be going through that list saying, do I have any of these symptoms? Yes or no. If the answer is no, you're clear to come on campus and show a green health pass with that Fort Lewis app and engage in any of the student activities that are going on in the classroom or out of the classroom. Employees have to follow the same protocol. So it's not just the students, our employees. One of the things that we think really kept us in person most of the year and all the spring semester was that all of our community members engaged in the symptom tracking, making sure that they were healthy before they came to class, before they came to campus. That's probably good with COVID or without COVID. Don't come, don't come to work, don't go to school if you're sick, right? Um, testing, we've talked about that. Um, and I'll answer any questions regarding testing after, after the slideshow. Next slide, please. So move in, a lot of you are probably wondering how move in is gonna take place. You will get instructions on your move in by July 15th. That will give you your move in date. It will either be August 25th or August 26th. Uh, it's staggered over two days. We really we, we block students into two-hour blocks generally. 
and that really spreads things out. It makes it a lot easier on the students and their families, and it also makes it easier on our staff to manage the move-in process. Uh, we're excited about how that played out last semester, and that's just a better experience for all of us. Two helpers will be allowed to be part of that moving experience with the students. So whoever that is in your family, whoever the lucky two are that get to move furniture upstairs or whatever that looks like for your student, um, we are gonna allow two people to do that. And we're just asking that they be asymptomatic. So no symptoms present and that they let us know that when they move in. We will require masks for everybody moving in. And then if you're not vaccinated, but you meet our exemption policy, we will be testing those students during the if, And, okay, the last little blurb there, this is an important one. If you cannot get the vaccination in your community, and I emphasize if you cannot get it in your community, because it will be much better if you do over the summer between now and then, but if you cannot, we will have vaccinations available during move-in for those that need them. So that will be part of our move-in process. Next slide. Housing. What does it look like um, to live at Fort Lewis College? Well, there's a lot of different housing options online. You all can look at the housing website to determine which floor plan works for you. I just went through this with my, with my student. I have a daughter that's going to college for the first time and we looked at all the floor plans together and filled out the roommate application survey. Um, so I know there's a lot of stress that goes into that decision and, and um, it's important to find the right fit for you. We do have quite a few options from shared space to, to single room to apartment style living. It is important to get on that right away because it is assigned on a first come first serve basis. Um, things to remember, our residence halls do close over winter break. They'll be, they'll be open over Thanksgiving. They will close over winter break unless you're in the apartments. Apartments actually stay open year round. So apartments stay open, the other residence halls will close over winter break. You can leave your personal items in the residence hall, and then you will be asked to check out and come back at the start of the spring semester. And make sure to consult with the recommended pack packing list to know what to bring. Don't bring too much stuff. That's, that's my biggest advice, or else your parents will be taking a lot of that stuff home. Your family will be taking the large pictures, the extra microwave, I think, it, I think it's important to think of minimalist things at first, and then if you need more stuff, you can always get it later. But uh, the rooms start to shrink the more stuff you put in. All right, housing overview. Housing, I, I saw this question in the chat. Housing and roommate assignments will be handed out on June 15th. Check your email for that information. So that's exciting. And then July 15th, you will be given that move-in date and time. Please make sure to come in on that day and time because we are staffing according to how many people we, we schedule during those times. So please make sure to come in during that scheduled time. And if you can't make it for, for a reason, one reason or another, contact housing as soon as possible and let us know so we can make accommodations for you. Um, August reminder, so you will be getting some more communications on move-in details, procedures, et cetera. And then campus dining, a lot of you are probably curious on what dining looks like on campus. And I've done a lot of college tours over the last few years. And I would have to say that we have one of the premier campus dining situations on campus. We have a lot of options. We have healthy options. We have allergic stations. So you just need to let our staff know what you may be allergic to. And they will design meal plans built for you. And that's the kind of service they provide in our dining services, which is great. Um, you can grab a go, you can eat in there. And then we also have some fast food options as well. Next slide. Orientation, what's orientation gonna look like? Well, I'm excited to say it's gonna look a lot different than last year. Last year was only online. This year we will have in-person orientation. If you move in, well, I'll get to that schedule in a second. But we will have in-person orientation August 26th, 27th, and 28th. And it will be based on your assigned move-in time. So you move in one day, you have orientation the next. Family orientation will also be in person and it will be available for those two lucky family members that are helping the student move in. You can get more information at our website about orientation. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the schedule. So what's that schedule look like? Um, so right now we're still developing, you know, how vaccinations and testing and all that's going to play out. But the plan will be, if you are moving in on August 25th, 
We will have a vaccination clinic available for those that need it on August 25th before they start the move-in process. You will go through the move-in process, get moved into your residence hall, and that's all you will have to do that first day. So you'll have time to visit with your family, go out, enjoy Durango's downtown, whatever, whatever you'd like to do for that day. The next day will be your orientation day, and that day will be both student and family orientation. And so that will be one full day of activities. And then Saturday, you'll come back Saturday for an all-campus welcome, which will be the entire first year class. Um, and similarly, in exact, in example two, you see that that's the same thing, except you're moving in on Thursday, August 26th versus Wednesday, August 25th. So if you move in on Thursday, orientation happens on Friday, campus welcome happens on Saturday. And I will be available for questions after the slide show is done. Hey, Jeff. Thank you so much. That was that was a lot of information. I'm sure that everyone is digesting a lot of that as, as we speak. And we have a really active Q&A. Thank you all for being so involved. We appreciate that. We appreciate your engagement. And I have a couple of questions that I would love to pitch to you right now, if that's OK, Jeff. Um, first of all, uh, could you talk to us a little bit? We have a lot of interest in understanding how move-in uh, for those that are involved in peak experiences will work. Could you talk a little bit about what move-in will look like for that group of students? Absolutely. And, uh, and I will say that the best information will come from your peak coordinator. So the person that's in charge of communicating with the students. Traditionally, this is how it's laid out. Um, the Friday before, so the week before this move-in happens on the Friday, traditionally our academic program, Summer Bridge program, will welcome students onto campus and they will move into their spot and that's an on-campus program. So they actually live in their residence hall, they attend the programs that they need to attend. And then um, when their roommate shows up on regular move-in day, you know, it's, they're already in there with all their stuff. Um, the other two peak experience programs move in on Sunday of that week. So it's, it's a couple of days less. And if you are in the Summit the San Juans program, what you will do is you will move it, you will just move your stuff in on Sunday and then you'll head into the backcountry. So you'll come in, drop off all your gear. I'm probably not your gear because you're taking that in the backcountry, but everything but your gear will stay in your room for the week. And then when you come back, you will be able to meet your roommate and actually get settled into your room. So that's the way it looks for that. And then our Native American Bridge program is also on campus. So you'll move into your spot on Sunday get all your rooms situated, and then you will participate in activities on campus throughout the week, um, that week. Okay, perfect. Can you also give us a little more information or talk to us a little bit about what the mask protocols in the residence halls will look like? I can try. I will say we're, we're constantly adapting based on local and state guidance. Right now, what our governor is telling us is that if our community is 80 to 85% vaccinated, we will not be required to wear masks indoors in some situations. And so if that's the case and our guidance stays consistent, I would anticipate in residence halls, we will not be wearing masks as long as we can hit that number. So it really relies on our community members to get, to get vaccinated, honestly. Um, our classroom spaces right now, we do plan on our classrooms being masked for now um, until we get additional guidance from our local health authority. Um, so I would plan to wear masks indoors in groups for now, and then we're hoping we can lessen some of those restrictions as we get more guidance. Great, perfect. Um, just to back up a little bit, is in terms of the move in for those that are involved in peak experiences is the is the move in for athletes pretty similar that's a good question um athletes will actually i mean they they move in at all different times um so depending on the sport depending on the coach depending on a lot of different factors and when they can get their physicals and all that stuff that gets coordinated by the coach um and some some athletes move in i believe as early as august 8th and some move in as late as you know the day before classes start. So I would suggest that they really reach out to their coach for more detailed information on how that works. Okay, thank you. And hey, Jeff, your audio is cutting in and out just a little bit. We can hear you really well when you're a little bit closer. So just um, as a 
asking a couple of other questions, if you could stay just a little bit closer. Um, And so let's, um, if we could actually take a quick step back, we're getting a number of questions that are related to the vaccine itself. And I think it might be a good moment to take a pause and address some of those with, with Tom and with Luke. So if we could um, back up and chat a little bit about some of the concerns that we're seeing some of our students and families show about genetic modification and um, concern about the safety of the vaccine for their students. Dr. Casillas, would you mind chatting with us a bit about that? Sure thing. That's one of the questions that's actually been thrown out there quite a bit about the concern of genetic modification. Clearly, there's nothing in the scientific literature that we've been presented um, from the CDC and from several other sources, even outside universities that have been following this that have hinted towards any concerns of genetic modification. Two of the vaccines don't even enter into the nucleus of the cell. So there's actually, scientifically speaking, that's sort of like the data center of your cell where all of your genetic material is stored inside of the cell. The Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine don't even enter into that area. All of the work that they do is actually done in the surrounding area of the cell or the cytoplasm of the cell. But even with the adenovirus technology that's sort of in the Johnson Johnson, the AstraZeneca, all of the studies that were done prior to the release back in January had no evidence of any type of genetic interference or mutation that's been out there. And since that time period, so since we started doing vaccine back at uh, the end of December, all of the millions of people that have received vaccines over that time period, there's been nothing in any of the scientific literature or the medical literature that's hinted towards any type of concerns in genetic interference or genetic damage being done to any of the individuals that have received the vaccine. And, and let me just build on that. And then Katie, I know there's a lot of other questions like where do I score, store my skis? And uh, you know, can I bring my dog to campus? So, so questions that are equally important, but let me just take a high level one. Um, you know, when we were thinking about this as a policy, I think it's important for our community members to know a couple of things. One, we already have an existing vaccine policy on campus. We, we require uh, measles, mumps, and rubella. So, so this is kind of part of what we do. Um, second, I think we learned so much from just COVID and, and really, you know, what it meant for a campus to truly care for students. And what we want to, to do is not only protect individuals, but protect the entire campus, as well as protect the community of Durango in which we're a part of. So what we know is that the greater saturation that we have of the vaccine, um, the more we're able to protect ourselves, each other on campus, and our broader community. And, and, and that's what we've committed to from the beginning. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that we stayed open uh, this entire semester. I think there was a question in there about, you know, are, what can you say about staying open? We did everything we can to stay open. And, and obviously with, with the vaccine numbers that we're hoping we hit, I'll even make it easier. So, so that's, that's a really important thing to remember. Um, and it's really what led the governor to, to make his decision as well as all of the other Colorado publics to, to follow, um, in, in essence, um, our decision about four weeks later. So, so we, we think it obviously just makes great sense um, for the community. Great, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Luke. We have some other questions coming in that are related to um, um, orientation and housing. And so Jeff, I just wanted to pitch uh, another question or two to you, and and then we will um, have Jess come in and chat with us about next steps. And so um, one of the questions that we have here is, um, when will roommates connect with each other and when can they start making plans on moving in? Yes, yeah, so that'll be June 15th. That's coming soon. Um, so that's an important date to look out for. You will get your roommate assignment on June 15th and you will be allowed to connect with that student. Perfect. All right, let's, um, let's keep on trucking. Thank you, Jeff, for all of those, those answers. We're gonna have plenty more as we, as we keep on moving. 
it's my pleasure now to introduce Jess Savage, our Director of Admission, and she's going to chat with us and give some information about what's happening next. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's great to see such a great and diverse audience with us tonight. Um, I'm going to walk through a few of our next steps. We have been sending you lots of emails and love from the admission office, and we really don't intend to stop until classes start. Um, but I want to hit some of the highlights tonight and um, answer some questions that I see coming in about some of these items. So first up, let's talk about class registration, the next big exciting step for our future Skyhawks. So for those of you who have already confirmed your enrollment, you're committed to Fort Lewis College for the fall, um, whether you're a first year student or a transfer or a returning student, uh, you will be sent the advising questionnaire. This is an online sort of survey of your interests. Um, our goal in that questionnaire is to capture your intended majors, minors, liberal arts core interests, uh, things that we should know about you coming in the door in your academic goals. Also, there's space on that questionnaire for you to provide information about your sort of hopes and dreams for your schedule, things that will be important for us to know as our advising team is putting together your first semester schedule for you. So for our first year students coming in the door, that questionnaire is your very first step in working towards registration. Your Skyhawk advisor, which is an academic advisor here, then takes your questionnaire and all your very thorough responses, and they craft your first semester schedule for you. Um, I sort of joke that like they've been doing this for a long time, so they know what classes you need to take to stay on track for their, your major interests. They know the sequencing of our curriculum really well, and they really do their best to individually create each schedule for each student. At that point, they share the schedule with you. They'll send it to you by email and also a good old fashioned paper copy in the mail. And on that paper copy, they actually make some notes and make, like let you know a bit about their thinking and what classes they've placed you in. And then you also have the opportunity to start the conversation at that point with your advisor. If you have questions, if you wanna make a change, if you have a change of heart over the summer and you said engineering, but now you're thinking philosophy, great. There's lots of ways you can connect with your advisor over the summer. Um, and have that conversation. I have to say we have found that this is a really great model for two reasons. One, it sort of takes the pressure off of you as the incoming student and that concern about getting it right, right out of the gate. And then the second thing is it really lets you start the conversation with your advisor from a much deeper and, and more productive point when you have something in front of you to start with. For our transfer students, uh, you will also take the advising questionnaire same kinds of questions. Our Skyhawk advising team is gonna take your questionnaire responses. They're gonna take your official transcript evaluation, which we complete at that point. And they're gonna to start to map what they think your um, path to graduation is going to look like. But once you submit your questionnaire as a transfer student, you will actually set up a 45 minute meeting with your Skyhawk advisor, because we know our transfer students are often coming to us with lots of complex um, courses and experiences, and we want to make sure that we really work hard to get you into the right upper division courses and working towards that major. So slight difference between first year and transfer students, um, but in both cases, the advisor is really doing that initial heavy lift for you, which is great. If you have already confirmed and you haven't done that questionnaire yet, I want to motivate you to go hop online tonight and get that submitted. So another important thing for you to manage along the way are all of the other next steps. So there's great, great questions coming in the chat about um, parking, can I bring a car, um, billing statements, all of those things. Well, we have a couple of different resources for you in our admitted student uh, checklist. It's available on our website, which we'll show you in a second. We're gonna send you a paper copy. And your financial aid, of course, is another really important piece of your next step. So go ahead and go to the next slide, please, Madison. So referenced here, you can see the admitted student checklist, which is fortlewis.edu slash admitted. It's online, walks you through your next steps. That blue box is the version of the paper copy we're going to send you in July, where your admission counselor is starting to check off the things you've done and help you keep track. And the next slide, Madison, the other resource you have is in your admission portal. So when you applied for admission, you created an account, you can log back in there and click on where it says next step. Um, you'll see your next steps checklist. And so we try to keep you apprised of your next steps and missing requirements all throughout this summer. And the best resource you have through this process is your admission counselor. Um, we have a great team of counselors, many of whom I hope you've connected with already. We work with geographic territories. So for our students from Hawaii, I am your admission counselor. For our transfer students, Kayla is your admission counselor. 
And these are folks that you really can reach out to in our office anytime all summer long with, with these kinds of specific questions. And we have an easy tool for you online. Go ahead, Madison. Uh, so that you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your counselor. If you want to dig in um, to the checklist together, if you have questions specific about housing or your personal circumstances, we are happy to chat with you one-on-one. -on -one. So another kind of thing to think about, a little bigger picture, aside from the checklist, uh, bigger picture, we want to really think about that transi transition to campus in the fall. We're so excited that you're joining our community, and we've got a number of things in place to support our students coming in the door and making sure that you really do feel like you're plugging in. Um, a little later on over the summer, you're gonna receive our student interest survey. This is a brief survey. It's not like, it, it should not feel as exhausting as even the advising questionnaire, which isn't really that bad. Um, but we wanna let, know a little bit more about your interests and experiences coming in the door so we can help connect you with things on campus. You're going to have a Skyhawk welcome team member who's a current Fort Lewis College student uh, work with you over the summer as a sort of unofficial resource uh, to answer your questions, help you get connected, help you navigate your next steps. And they're real life students here, so they can absolutely tell you how it is. Uh, then of course we have our orientation programming, which segues really nicely into that first year launch class, which is a seminar course all of our first year students take. Um, and then as I mentioned, you're gonna get to know your Skyhawk advisors. We have a team of success coaches and peer educators on campus. So and of course, our dynamite faculty in our classes. And um, I think I just speak for the whole campus when I say we are so excited and ready to see you here on campus and to see what um, great things you'll accomplish. So really looking forward to working with you through the summer. So to recap, um, advising questionnaire is available now if you've confirmed. So make sure you're working on your class registration. The new student checklist is an ongoing thing you'll take care of over the summer. Um, Housing assignments, as Jeff said, will come out on June 15th, and that will include your roommate's information and their contact information as well. And I did see a question in the chat about if you, when you applied for housing, if you selected your precise room, um, you, we're like 98% certain that that is going to be your room assignment. There have been very rare cases where they've had to make a change to that. So you can really, with confidence, see yourself in that room. Um, orientation details will be coming out middle of the summer, the specific agenda for each program, in orientation details as well. And then you'll get that move-in assignment that'll have your date and time of your move-in. You'll receive that no later than July 15th. Quick note about billing statements. Those come out late July, and I did see some questions in the Q&A. We have payment plans available. And really, we recommend that you work closely with your financial aid counselor um, and the business office you know, to set up those payment plans if that's something you're interested in. Last but not least, in August, we'll send a few more reminders about textbooks, parking passes, how your housing move-in procedures one more time. Again, you're really going to be tired of emails from us by the end of the summer, so stay in touch um, and keep, keep checking and asking, checking the emails and asking questions. That's what we're here for. So I know I flew through a lot of that information, um, and Katie, I'm sure you have questions for me and the other panelists. Yes, we have lots of questions. I wanted <laughs> lots of them, which is which is wonderful, which is wonderful. I wanted to take a second to ask you, Jess, if you wouldn't mind letting our students and families know about what they can do if they'd like to come to visit campus this summer. What options Thank do they you. have? Thank you. Yes, I, I failed to mention that. Uh, so we know that a lot of you were not able to come visit us as part of that traditional college search process. So we do have daily campus visits um, Monday through Friday, all summer long, we welcome you to come visit our campus, bring your family, take that campus tour so that when you arrive on campus in August, maybe that's not your first time stepping foot on campus. We know that that's um, important to a lot of students to see us ahead of time. We also have specific programming um, pretty much every Friday through July for our admitted student days. And even if you're confirmed and you know you're coming here, you're still an admitted student, so come on by. Um, those events include a little more opportunity for you to connect with your Skyhawk advisor in person, meet with financial aid if that's something that you'd like to do, um, and visit some of our other offices on campus and tend to those sort of nitty gritty questions and next steps. So lots of great options. Thank you. And similar, and this might be a question for you, Jess, it also I think um, might be a great question for Jeff. Can we talk about how? Um, how students are connecting with each other and what events might be out there for students to get to know each other and to make friends. Jeff, do you want to take this one? You want me to get started? 
I'll get started. So as I mentioned, right off the bat, we want to make sure that our students are getting connected to one another through our orientation programming. Uh, and so as Jeff explained, there's sort of a small group orientation on your first day, and then the all campus welcome is that second full Saturday day long orientation, which, you know, any good orientation program is going to be a little bit of content, a little bit of important information, and also a little bit of the social and connection kind of opportunity. So our folks in orientation do a great job of programming right off the bat for you. Um, we go ahead, Jeff, I don't know if you want to jump in. Yeah, there will be um, a lot of in-person options, especially as the first week of school rolls out. Uh, we will do a lot of things outside um, and encourage everybody to get to know each other so they have successful relationships kind of moving into the semester. There's also some virtual ways to connect with other students, yeah, you know, beyond traditional Facebook pages and some of those things that I know are no longer as cool as they once were. Um, you can use the Fort Lewis app to um, connect with students right now. You can download the app and see what's going on at Fort Lewis College once you are a confirmed student and have your login information. So that's a good way to get to know folks in the community virtually. And then when you get to campus, we will have a lot planned for you the first two weeks to make sure you are connected. Great. Along, um, it, speaking of connecting with folks and um, what it's like the, in the very beginning of your college experience with us at Fort Lewis College. Uh, Jess, I think this might be a good one for you to talk a little bit about what the first year launch program is and um, what that's like for a student walking through our doors. Yeah, certainly. For our first year students, you either have already seen it on the questionnaire or you will, but we do ask you about what category of topics you're interested in for your first year launch class. And first year launch is a semester, or I'm sorry, a seminar style class. Anytime you hear that, it means discussion based. Um, it's just one college credit. So it meets once a week. It's taught by faculty from all across campus and they are topics based courses and the topics vary along with the interests of the faculty. So really taking a look at the first year launch website, which I'm sure somebody can put in the chat here for everyone. Uh, to see the course descriptions and see what the offerings are is a great opportunity for you then to put on your questionnaire what you'd be interested in taking. Um, really the first year launch class serves sort of two purposes. One of course is to get you plugged into campus, right? To meet a group of students who hopefully have a similar interest to you, get you connected with one of our fantastic faculty members who are teaching in that program. And then the other purpose is really to give you a little bit of an orientation to the expectations and experience that you'll come to know and love as our liberal arts experience here at Fort Lewis. So giving you a little chance to hone those critical thinking skills, giving you a chance to get comfortable in a college classroom where really you're gonna be expected to contribute to the conversation as much as anyone else. So it becomes a sort of safe space to adjust to that expectation as well. Uh, they're great topics to really go check them out. Tom, I think you taught one one year. So I was trying to get off mute and um, video. I did. I've been parents and, and students. I've, I've been banned from teaching. I was I was only marginal, and I always told our students that if I weren't the president, people would probably complain about me. So no, I loved it. It was amazing. Uh, it was great. I taught um, uh, the first two years of it on leadership and. We had great outside speakers come talk. We had a Navy SEAL. We had community leaders uh, in town. We had just all sorts of people coming and CEOs of companies uh, talking about what leadership meant for them. It was great. They ranged from um, the geography of purgatory to music to we had one on uh, football. Uh, so all sorts of great stuff. Jeff DuPont taught one as well. And they really are just a way that we connect closely with students. I, I see my students that I had in first year uh, experience uh, throughout campus and, and it's just awesome to see them. So one of those signature programs that that we've used to really help, you know, this is not a place where there's a 500 person lecture hall and we know that, but we even want to go more than that. Just make sure students have a really close experience and, and build a relationship with faculty and each other um, right off the bat. And, and I see it even a lot of my first year students, you know, they're still pals afterwards and it, and it, it was a great thing. Um, and so the campus has really been thinking about that uh, all, all told, you know, how do we make this a very welcoming, uh, inclusive, uh, diversity rich environment for our students and, and something we're incredibly proud of. 
Wonderful. Thank you. I would love to take a first year launch course. We've had a number of folks in our admission office teach some of those classes as well, which I think is a great uh, way to bring up a question that folks have asked regarding what's the difference between an admission counselor and an advisor. So talking about that personalized experience that you were just speaking of, Tom, and how we really get to know our students. Right now, you're probably working very closely with, with, with some of us. And what does that look like um, when you get to Fort Lewis and you, you then have other folks that are supporting you? You want me to get us yeah. started on this one? Sure. Once you get us started, anyone else can join in too. Yeah. So right now, you just let me put up the picture of all of our fabulous admission counselors. We work with our students one-on-one -on -one through the admission process, and we're really your person um, all the way up until the start of classes. So if you have questions along the way, you're not sure about processes or something we mentioned here tonight wasn't clear, reach out absolutely to our office. Um, we slowly start the transition for you over the summer with the registration piece and connecting you with a Skyhawk advisor. And our advisors are um, coordinated by division. And so a division is a group of majors on campus that generally have some similar threads through them. For example, we have a division of um, science, engineering, and mathematics, right? So there are ad specific advisors who work with students in that division. And so then they sort of become your go-to person for all things academic. Um, now, when it comes to advising, you will also, especially as you approach your upper division, your upperclassmen years, um, kind of transition to faculty advising as well in your department within your major. And that becomes important for you um, when you think about connections to internships and research and career opportunities to have that close working relationship with your faculty, which is so inherent to our uh, community anyway. Uh, and then the other piece, I mentioned that you have a financial aid counselor. So our financial aid office works with students based on their last name. So every single student on campus has a dedicated financial aid uh, counselor that they can work with um, and that they can go over your, uh, your FAFSA information. They can review your financial aid award with you. Um, in fact, this time of year for students who are still deciding on whether Fort Lewis is going to be a good fit or an option for them, your financial aid counselor can sit down one-on-one -on -one with you and compare your financial aid awards ac across different institutions to help you really compare apples and apples and understand your bottom line. And you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with your um, financial aid counselor through your admission counselor can help you set that up too. So um, yeah, again, we're sort of your concierge as you enter campus. You'll come through your admission counselor to get you connected with everything you need as you're entering. And then once you're here, you've got a Skyhawk advisor, you've got faculty advisors, but a lot of great people on campus ready to help you all four years. Wonderful, thank you, Jess. Jeff, I think this is a question for you. And um, although I think we all giggle a little about these questions, they're really important because food is really important to your, to your life and to your experience. What kinds of appliances are you allowed to have in your residence hall room? Are you allowed to have a coffee pot? Are you allowed to have an air fryer? What sorts of, um, I really love small kitchen appliances myself, but so which ones would I be allowed to bring with me? I might have to punt on that. I might have to look that up. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Jess, do you know? I'm gonna say the rule of thumb is if it is a fire hazard, it is not allowed. So <laughs> That's a good at, rule. Right, like anything with open coils or hot plates or any of those kinds of things are absolutely not allowed. Um, I, I know for a fact the Keurigs and coffee makers are because as a coffee addict, I paid very close attention to whether that was allowed. And, and we are talking, it's not done yet. We've got these amazing Andorac, Andorac chairs all over campus. We've been talking about fire pits. So uh, not in your resident hall room, but um, <laughs> on campus. Uh, uh, so so that, is, that is coming. Uh, so parents, you're saying bring the marshmallows. Yeah, s'mores. Uh, so hold me accountable to that if we don't have fire pits up in February. We're working on it. So we have uh, we have lots of questions and just a handful of minutes left. So we're, we will follow up with folks who, um, who, who aren't asking those questions anonymously so that we can make sure to get you those answers. And um, I'd like to take a, a quick move back to uh, a question that came a little bit earlier. So this is for you, Luke specifically to discuss efficacy rate and what that means for the safety of our campus community. I'm assuming that efficacy rates from the vaccinations after you're fully yes. vaccinated. Is that, that, that sounding correct? Yes. So 
I can give you what was put out when the vaccines are first studied. There's been a little bit of fluctuation. The first thing that I want to say, and it's probably the most important, the efficacy of decreasing severe illness that results in hospitalizations and death is in the high 90 to almost 100% range for anybody who's vaccinated. That's, I think, the biggest message that all of us should hear from all the vaccines that are out there. They keep you from getting severely ill if you are exposed to COVID and landing in the hospital or possibly resulting in death from COVID. So that's the biggest message. The other information in short answer is Jane j when it first came out, was posting an efficacy rate of about 76%, meaning you're about 70%, 76% rate uh, likely not to be able to pick up COVID when exposed to that initial uh, virus that was out there and actually what the vaccines were made for. Um, Pfizer was about 94%, Moderna about 95%. I hedge on that, not because I'm questioning the efficacy of the vaccine, but because we've had mutations that occur. India is a perfect example where you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people getting the virus and it replicating. That's what leads to mutations. Every time somebody gets COVID, you have 100,000 replications of virus in your body that gets produced as the virus does, what viruses does. Every time the virus reproduces, it can mutate. So all the vaccines cut down your risk of getting a virus, but even more importantly, they cut down the risk of you getting a virus that'll mutate into something that makes it more contagious. So that's the big message with vaccinations. Not only does it help protect you from getting it, it helps protect from the virus changing into something that's going to be more contagious. So when you hear about the British um, mutation, when you hear about the India mutation, all of those type of mutations happen in populations where you have a lot of virus reproducing. And that's what makes me sort of not want to send out solid messages. I can tell you what the vaccines, when they came out from being produced and tested and put in the general population look like, but with the mutations that have occurred from individuals getting the virus since that time, it's changed a little bit. But one thing that hasn't changed in any of the literature that I've seen, it still prevents us from getting severely ill and resulting in hospitalizations or death. Um, j and is a fantastic vaccination, even if it does drop into 70 from 76%. Moderna, Pfizer, if they drop down into the 90 percentile from 94%, they're still fantastic vaccines that'll help protect us from getting severe illness, which is what you go for with vaccines. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Casillas. And again, it's that so important um, for, for students who can get vaccinated now, do so. Um, I'm vaccinated, my wife's vaccinated, my 16-year-old boys are vaccinated. We're sort of our own little Petri dish. We've got a Moderna and a Pfizer and a J&J, so we'll, 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 do all, we'll see who's most effective. Um, but I think the sense of relief, knowing that we're not going to get you know, my parents ill when we see them or that we're going to do our part to, um, to, to shortcut mutation, I think is really important. Um, there's a question in there, and maybe I'll take it about uh, how will we treat students who aren't vaccinated. So, so let me let me address that here from the from the presidential seat. Um, everyone is required to comply with our vaccine policy. So, so just like with MMR, um, that's really the first thing. Um, it could be the case, let, let's say that I'm, um, I have an immunocompromised com condition and I'm unable to get um, the vaccine or, or I'm you know, receiving some sort of treatment and my doctor says, you know, no, that's a risk to you. Um, if I have a medical uh, exemption, I would file that medical exemption uh, and, and say Jeff DuPont um, wouldn't know uh, if he was my teacher or if he were, uh, you know, going on a, a hike with me. He wouldn't know if, if I had or hadn't the vaccine. He would just know that I complied with policy. Um, but the institution will know. And in essence, if you are unable to get the vaccine because of a medical exemption or, or a non-medical exemption per Colorado law, um, you'll be subject to more testing um, and you'll be subject to quarantine if there's an exposure on campus. So, so, that's, so that's the big, the big issue um, for, for people to track. I think there was a question about, you know, testing is invasive. Um, you know, we, we, there should be um, exemptions to testing. There isn't exemptions to testing. There weren't this year. Um, we were very firm in that because it's really what helped us stay open. And, and, and we did a phenomenal job uh, and are gonna work on that through the year. Because what we know with, with our campus and what we love about our campus is that hands-on experiential learning Great work with faculty is why you come to Port Lewis, and we fought really hard to make sure that happened, and we're going to do the same in the coming year.
thanks. <laughs> Thank you to all of our panelists for being here. Uh, we appreciate your time and your expertise and your efforts. And primarily, thank you to all of you students and families. We have 117 of you here right now. So we're so grateful that you took time out of your busy week and your busy lives to be here. Uh, many of you are finishing up your senior year of high school. And uh, I wish you all the best success and enjoyment out of these last days. And that it, it leads you to um, a, a path of excitement and energy to us at Fort Lewis College. So please know that we're a resource for you. I hope if anything that you gain from this presentation, you can see that we care very much about you as an individual student. And our entire job is to help make your experience coming to Fort Lewis and at Fort Lewis successful, rigorous, engaging, and supportive. Um, one of our admission folks is throwing our contact information, Bundy is throwing our contact information into the chat right now. We're gonna end the webinar here in just a second. I'm gonna give you just a moment to go ahead and write down uh, contact information so that you can reach back out to us. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. Enjoy the summer. Enjoy your last weeks in school. Have a great day. Have a great night. Take care. See you in the fall and uh, have a great summer. Can't wait to see, can't wait to meet everybody. Take good care. Thanks all.